Hello and welcome to this InflectorCon 2023 virtual bonus session. InflectorCon will be held from April 19th through the 21st in Washington, D.C. on the campus of Gallaudet University. We are looking forward to three days of customer training, partner meetings, industry sessions, networking, and more. Check us out at www.inflectorcon.com. In this session, we hear from Ben O'Connor, head of QA at Storyblocks. Let's join Ben now as he leads his virtual bonus session entitled, Breaking Out the Silo, Bridging the Gaps Between Testing Teams in Your Organization. Hello, everyone. This is Inflectorcon 2023. Welcome to my bonus talk, Breaking Out the Silo, Bridging Gaps Between Testing Teams in Your Organization. My name is Ben O'Connor, and I'm head of QA at Storyblocks. We're a company of a bit over 150 employees total, and we have about 45 engineers and a testing team of three. If you're curious, Storyblocks is the first subscription-based stock video, audio, and image content provider. So if you're asking yourself, what's stock content? Well, let's say you're making a video and you need a really, really cute dynamic duo of pets, or you want to pretend that you were the world's greatest baker for your Insta account. Or you need a slow motion video of some hot dogs in a blender, but you don't have a blender, you don't have any hot dogs, and you don't have the ability to slow down time. So all of this stock content from my talk is sourced directly from Storyblocks. So I've been a tester with Storyblocks for almost five years now. And before my current role, I spent over 15 years talking to the customers of the world and helping to solve their problems. I started with the company that I'm at now as a customer support manager, and I was dealing with customers with a variety of feelings about my product, to say the least. This is relevant as I've taken some of what I have learned there and have applied it to what I'll review today. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'll be talking about silos. <laughs> oh, wait, uh, not those silos. Sorry, I had to at least once. We'll actually be talking about silos <clears throat> built by isolated teams within an organization, which I imagine many of you have felt. I'll start by reviewing and defining what engineering silos are to me. Then I'll go into why silos occur generally in an organization and specifically why I think they occur within testing teams. Next, I will cover how silos can impact your organization. And then I'll review some tips and tricks that I picked up over time on how to break out of those silos. And then finally, I'll review some positive impacts I have seen across my team and across my organization as we've broken out of the silos we previously were in. So let's kick it off by discussing what silos are. So silos are a very common phenomenon in many engineering, testing teams, and organizations. It's super easy to allow them to happen. And they refer to the situation where different teams or departments within an organization work in isolation without sufficient collaboration, communication, and integration with each other. And they can happen even within a small team, like a testing team, due to those within a team working on different projects at the same time. So especially if there are no clear, regular, recurring means of communication with others, they occur. And silos can happen in, in person and especially remotely, uh, but they're particularly difficult remotely as it's really hard to have efficient communication and relationships. And it's easier just not to interact with others. You can go a whole day and barely talk to anyone at all and just do your job. Now, especially if you don't realize your, your team is in a silo, a silo can also manifest itself in kind of a feeling. It's, it's a feeling of frustration. It's a feeling of lack of creativity. And especially if you don't realize it, it's a feeling of being demoralized and you just generally feel like you have mistrust in those around you and even those within your own team. It could be your manager, your boss, or your coworker in your testing team. So let's dig into why. Generally speaking, I found that silos occur and they occur within an org and within a testing team. Organizational structure. So when an organization is divided into different departments, each responsible for a specific area of work, it leads to a siloed approach. So especially when those different departments all work on different parts of the product and they do not have dependencies upon each other, 
it can be really easy for them to not interact with one another. Each department may be focused on optimizing its own area of responsibility without really considering how that work fits into a larger picture of the product as a whole. And so this can lead to missed opportunities for collaboration and for innovation, as well as a lack of understanding about the work being done in other departments. And it can also create redundancies as different departments may be working on similar tasks without even realizing it. And when there isn't enough inconsistent, there's inconsistent or there's disrupted communication between, between teams, departments or individuals, it leads to a lack of understanding of the work that others are doing and thus a lack of collaboration and communication. Now this likely only increases over time and it can help it to really expand the silos that happen because the communication only multiplies and therefore if you are talking to someone, you're probably not gonna to talk to them later and it's probably gonna increase the groups that you're not talking to. Now I've seen this and still deal with this myself as we have over seven different engineering teams, some of which are separated in teams within the teams on top of a standard breakdown of organizations into teams like customer support and marketing and sales and so on. And so I often get stuck and see these little silos between these small teams within teams and between other teams. Limited resources. So in this case, <clears throat> I'm defining resources here as funding, staffing, equipment, and time. And when resources are scarce, each team or department may focus solely on its own priorities. And this can come from one of two things in my experience. So the first is when, let's say you have a brand new role. So you likely created this role due to demand for the role within the organization. Now, if that one person or the small group of people feel they're being pulled in many directions from every team in this new role, they may actually shut down and limit their communication to kind of focus, just getting their work done. And then that thus reduces the interactions they'll have with others as they really feel a need to meet the expectations of the role they were hired for. Now, the other side of this is teams that have limited resources, either due to say not enough team members on the team with a lack of investment, or let's say as, as many of you have probably felt and we've seen layoffs in the tech space, uh, layoffs of team members. I personally had this happen in my org. We recently had a 25% reduction in force and it really left work that needed to be done, but there weren't as many people to do it. And the people who had work now had more on their plate. And so the teams that took this work it created a silo within the stakeholders and with those teams because those individuals felt they really needed to narrow down their focus and get their work done. And so they were less likely to communicate than they were previously. If previously they had time to kind of mess around, they felt like it wasn't there anymore, especially after layoffs because they were worried potentially about losing their own job. Different goals. So if teams have different goals or incentives, they may not align with each other, leading to a siloed approach. So the team may be focused on their specific goals and not have time to break out of the silo as they want to get the reward or incentive for their specific group or their specific project they're working on. And we see this if a team does not have a goal across a larger org as well, such as engineering. So if in your company, let's say more technical backend teams are attempting to reach a goal of setting up a, a way to provide data for an existing product, but the front end product team is focused on creating new pages and events instead of the old pages and events, which is where the data backend team is pulling information from. You can imagine how in this scenario, those teams may end up working in isolation, each pursuing their own objectives without actually considering how their efforts could be coordinated to achieve the best outcome, or frankly, how they're kind of going for different goals. We may also have the same goals without realizing we have the same goals. So this is often due to a lack of transparency from leaderships within an organization. So for example, let's say we have two product teams both attempting to convert people into visiting the site more from visitors to active paying customers. If they are both working on the same page and on the same part of the product, they aren't communicating, they may create experiences which counteract the work 
the other team is doing. So they're trying to work on the same thing at the same time, not realizing that the other team is doing likewise. So we've discussed kind of like generally why silos occur in your organization, but I wanted to take some time to focus on why I think they occur in the group many of us are in, specifically the testing team. So as a testing team, it's really easy to fall into a silo, especially if you work in an organization where the act of testing, the product hasn't like shifted left, to use the kind of buzz term there, meaning the team isn't really involved in the development of a feature until the very end of the development of the feature being done. Generally, it's a bit before the product is provided to customers. And by the nature of testing being at the end, especially in larger organizations, it's likely the testing team has limited interaction with stakeholders within the org. And they may only be dealing with teams like product or developers or design. The testing team can have a lack of involvement in the development process, which then limits the interactions. And therefore, they're not really talking to others within the organization. Then the development team may be focused on creating and implementing new features, while the testing team is focused on finding and reporting issues. And this can make it difficult for two teams to collaborate effectively, as their goals and their priorities may be different. In addition, if the testing team is limited interaction with stakeholders within New York, it, it helps to create a further silo. It creates a further sense of isolation. And without a clear understanding of the broader goals and objectives of the organization, the testing team may really, really struggle to see how their work fits into the larger picture of the organization. So in many organizations, testing is seen as a specialized skill set where testers have a testing mindset that others outside of the testing team supposedly do not have. So agree or disagree, regardless of where you fall on that point, if testing is seen as a specialized skill that only testers can have, it can create the sense of separation between testers and everyone else, the rest of the team, the developers, product, engineering. Testers may feel like they're working in isolation and aren't fully integrated into the development process. Additionally, testing being a specialized skill can really limit the opportunity for testers to learn and grow in other areas they may be interested in. So testers may feel like they're stuck with a limited role of growth path. They can only go up a certain route, and they're not really given opportunities to expand their skills or take on new responsibilities. So an example that I see often is, let's say you start off doing some manual testing, and the only path available in your organization is to go into automation. You feel forced to do that, even if you're not necessarily interested in that. And often when you begin the automation, you hit a wall at the top where whatever your organization sets as the top of that ladder once you hit it, it's hard to go outside of that role. You're seen as a person doing the automation, and you may not be able to go to product or engineering or design or any other type of role that you're interested in. Others not testing. So if the testing team is the only team responsible for testing and others in your organization do not participate in ceremonies or activities that encourage testing through the feature development process, this can definitely cause silos. So other team members may not take ownership of quality, and they may not provide feedback on testing activities. This can result in a lack of shared responsibility for the quality of the product, as well as a lack of collaboration and communication between teams. In addition, if other team members aren't involved in testing-related activities, they may not have a clear understanding of, of what testing team does. They don't know what the testing team is doing every day. And that can really lead to misunderstandings and miscommunications. It can also lead to a lack of buy-in for testing-related processes and activities, as other team members may not see the value in them. If you want to change part of your process, if you want to use a new tool, it can be really hard to sell that when people don't understand the value in the specific thing that you're doing. So especially if we want to move fast, if we want to be efficient, if we want to deliver features often, the impact of silos can be really detrimental to the overall productivity and success of your organization. So let's kind of take some time to jump into the impacts I have seen. Reduced efficiency. 
So when different teams or departments work in silos, it can lead to inefficiencies and often duplication of work. Each team may be working on similar or overlapping tasks without realizing it. So we mentioned an example of this earlier with different goals. And I've had a few examples myself within my organization where I was working in customer support and we had these cases where we didn't really take good notes and log our customer contacts. When we reached out to customer contacts, we'd have an option to log a call or log an email or a ticket or a response. And we weren't doing a good job of that. And we were attempting to upsell our customers to a plan, which granted we no longer have, but it was an upsell to a new plan. And we had a few cases where we didn't reach out to a customer, we wouldn't take good notes. And the customer had already decided, I would like to take that new plan or would not like to take the new plan, take the offer. Only because we didn't have good notes to be contacted by another support rep at a later time, as a previous person didn't log their notes and they didn't they didn't put their contact in a clear, concise manner. <clears throat> and I've also had this happen in my testing experience when I was testing different features with multiple teams. So they had a few points of overlap. And, and when we realized they were working on similar things, we realized they weren't communicating outside their solo team. So in cases like this, the two teams would interact with similar parts of the code, and they wind up making changes to the code in ways that would impact the other team without realizing it. And this can get really messy if one team deploys, and it kind of pushes back the work the other team was doing. And it may highlight, in particular, bottlenecks you have in your organization and help you highlight why and how they are formed. So lack of communication between teams can lead to a general misunderstanding uh, and conflict, especially if the teams only communicate when they need something from another team or they're reaching out to discuss how the team kind of negatively impacted their work by making a change like we just mentioned. It can lead to this feeling of that team, the other team that you're not working with directly, kind of being seen in a negative light and it creates unintentional risks in the larger teams that you may have, like developers or engineering. So for example, and I have, I've had a situation where the development team makes changes to a feature without communicating to my testing team. And so when our testing team discovers the change, maybe because we're testing it and we're trying to figure out what's going on, we frankly felt really upset. We felt that we weren't informed. And I could see the impact of that on my team directly, as there's kind of this feeling that the developers were uncooperative or they were inconsiderate and they weren't really thinking of our time and the effort we put into something. And I found that it can kind of lead to this tension between the two teams. And it, team, it, it definitely has a decrease on team morale and productivity. It also does things like creating gossip or drama. And it generally makes it feel like the org you're in just really isn't a pleasant place to be. And it can also impact things like retention because of that. So without clear lines of communication, we see a lot of things like rumors. We see misinformation. We see unnecessary conflict. And generally, we see that it helps to make the work environment just feel bad, have an unpleasant place where you may not necessarily want to be. When teams work in silos, it becomes really difficult to collaborate, to share knowledge and ideas, and work towards a common goal that you all have, especially if there aren't meetings or groups or, or design reviews or guilds any place where ideas are encouraged to be shared, or things like documentation are poor, you often wind up in these situations where groups may not have an understanding of how the product or the code that they're creating on the product works. So they haven't really touched the product or that part of the product themselves, so they might not understand what it's doing necessarily because they haven't collaborated with the stakeholders who own that part of the product. They may not know who to go to as well. So if they need to touch a part of the product owned by someone else, because they haven't really communicated, they're in a silo, they're not sure where to start. And they haven't interacted with the team that would be responsible. So they often wind up feeling kind of lost and may spend extra time and effort just trying to figure it out on their own. Whereas if they didn't have that silo and bottleneck, they could reach out directly and it would solve both issues. Collaboration and cross-functional interaction often spark innovation. So when teams are siloed, it can really stifle creativity and prevent new ideas from being generated. 
So I don't know about y'all, but um, I get some of my best ideas just from soundboarding off of and talking to others outside of my team. It, it, uh, it serves as a gut check. So if I want to get feedback, I may not want to get feedback from someone in my team. I probably want to get feedback from someone outside of my team because I probably already picked my team's brain. And if I'm stuck in a silo, it makes it harder to do that. As I may get to a point where I feel uncomfortable reaching out to people I haven't really talked to, and I no longer want to bring up my ideas. I don't want to share my innovative things that I'm thinking of with my team or even other teams because I don't feel comfortable making that leap to talk to people and communicate. Delayed decisions. So when different teams or departments <clears throat> are not in sync, it can result in delayed decision-making and execution, which often leads to project delays and sometimes even missed deadlines, especially if there are dependencies on team A doing something over here followed by team B, and the teams don't really talk to each other due to the silos they have, it causes these unnecessary delays. So all of these are things that I've dealt with personally in Starbucks. And when I started testing uh, a few years back, I came into testing without having much experience. I was the only tester, and I'd often be given testing projects at the end of the feature being developed. So I wouldn't hear too much until I was tagged in a ticket indicating, hey, it's time for Ben to test. And I was the only tester across three teams at the time, engineering product squads. And given the demand of my role, everyone wanted to have it tested before it went out to customers. I often felt the need I mentioned earlier to kind of silence Slack, silence other means of communication, and really focus and hammer down on delivering the results of what I was testing to the team that requested it in a timely manner. I wanted to make sure I got it done efficiently. I noticed it kind of created the silo of one, a silo of me. And I often felt really drained and I felt like I wasn't in the loop for what was going down the pipeline or what was coming up. I felt stressed in. And even though I was testing for every team, being heads down all day to get caught up on the work that was coming in it just was a really lonely experience. And I felt frustrated. And I was really struggling to get through every day. I, I had some really undefined resentment, I noticed, towards the teams that I, I felt put me in these silos. And I just generally felt a lack of trust in, in psychological safety. And so it wasn't until they gave me another tester because of the workload I had that I started to train that I actually realized what was happening. And I realized what I wasn't doing wasn't very efficient. I realized the impact it was having on myself, as frankly, it was drained and I didn't have as much energy as I wanted to train this person. But I also realized that I was kind of putting some of that stuff that I talked about earlier from the impact, I was putting that on my new hire. I didn't realize it right away, but as I started to realize it, I went, oh, I see how I'm kind of saying that team does the thing, or, oh, this is how I feel about developing. And so... I started to make an effort to kind of break out of these silos. And now addressing these silos, I've learned, is constant work. And it requires all participants to make an effort. Not just one, not just myself as a lead or a person on another team, but everyone. And it can often be easier to keep ourselves in the silos and just operate in our day-to-day -day heads down than to break out of the silo. So I want to jump into how we can break out of these silos. What things can we do to help? I noticed it felt like I was more likely to have walls up with people that I wasn't familiar with or I didn't know. And so I thought, how can I get to know people earlier on before it gets past the phase where it's just awkward to do an introduction meeting? So like, you know, that point where it's been a few months, you haven't really talked to the person, but you're going to interact with them at some point, that point. It's awkward to say, hey, how are you? You're new. My name is Ben. And so I mentioned earlier, one of the key reasons we see this is, I think, because there are silos and lack of communication. And to me, I learned the best time to communicate and start communication, open those paths with others, was as soon as they start, the first few weeks up there. Specifically, if that team is a primary stakeholder in kind of the regular development work. And so for me, that's teams like design or, or other engineering teams or product. During the first few weeks in the organization, I set up this meeting with that person and then my team. 
And I'd like to start this meeting by kind of doing some light introductions, including things like how long I've been in my organization or 10 years, what my role is within the organization, and then some fun facts. I'd just like to learn a little more about the hire that just started. Where did they go previously? Have they had any fun traveling experience? Is there something silly they have? Do they have a family? Uh, do they really love plants? Things like that. You just learn in this meeting. And generally what we do is we walk through what our testing process is, how someone on that team that they join may be involved, and how we may be involved with testing for them. And we like to just prick their brain about their previous experience. We ask, like, what is your experience with software testing? Tell us about your previous roles, what the testers did, how they did it. And what's cool about this is it often generates these new ideas. Or if you have good ideas, it reinforces the good that you've done and the things you're doing in your organization. And so what I like about this meeting is it helps serve the purpose of making sure the first time you interact with this person, you've already had a non-transactional conversation, likely beyond the scope of what is being worked on, what's coming down the pipeline, when you need their support or, or the other way around, like they're reaching out to you, it makes it so they already have contact. And it really helps establish relationships and decrease the silos as when you have these relationships in place, it not only increases trust, but it also increases the likelihood that you're going to interact with that person at a later time. When something happens or you do something related to that thing they brought up, that was a fun fact, you might think, oh, new hire had that. I'm going to bring it up and mention it to him. And you're more likely to do something like reach out and chat about that. So process. There is a lot you can do with process changes that may help build the bridges we want to get to break out of these silos. So let's start by talking about shifting left. So while this is a term you hear often in talks that are talking about improving testing in your organization, there's a reason. It's super effective. And so this means you are performing the testing earlier in the process, particularly in the organization with testing teams. Shifting left means getting the testing team involved as early as possible in the future development life cycle, as early as the research phase and when you're starting to gather information and put together requirements. And so this breaks you out of the silo as a testing team is a team that helps inform others in the org and follow through with the steps to move the testing phase earlier. And so this has also added some unrelated benefits, which we'll discuss later, but things like finding bugs earlier to helping reduce cost. Silos can be easily formed, as I mentioned, when one team or group of individuals is the sole party responsible for that action, the action of testing or the action of owning quality. If your team is the only team responsible or expected to test the product, you can very easily only, or only interact with a team when testing needs to be done. By allowing others to test and help you address the problem space of how will a feature be tested and what does it mean to be tested, what is a plan for testability? You begin to kind of break down these silos. By getting input from multiple teams and individuals, you can identify potential issues or challenges early in the development process, which can really help to prevent problems down the line. By working together as a team, you ensure that testing is viewed as a shared responsibility and that Everyone in the organization, not just the testing team, is invested in ensuring the quality of the final product to make sure what goes out to your customers is high quality and is what you want. Perry, this is one that's really important to me. When I attempted to start breaking down the silos I saw in my organization, I mentioned earlier I was feeling really isolated. I wasn't really getting too much time. People, <clears throat> I wasn't sure how to get others to test. I wasn't sure how to make them touch the product and frankly, know what and how much was tested by the team. So I started to set up these meetings with developers. So when they would tag me and they would request something be tested, I'd say, okay, fine, we have to have a meeting. And in that meeting, and I still do these today, I start to ask them questions like, show me what you've tested so far. 
I ask that they do things like review the PRs and specifically focusing on things like the test code in particular, if they wrote some new test or if they're changing something that would need to be tested. And so I begin to see the impact of this is that gradually, as they know I'm going to set up a meeting when they request testing, they increase the amount of stuff they tested before the meeting begins. So we see developers and we see other people requesting testing, like product or marketing, actually doing more of their own testing independently, learning how the product works, and thus making less work for me. I can do more of the exploratory testing, the type of testing that I find that I want to do, or I might find more issues. And my team not only pairs now during development phases, but we also do this in a group pairing session or ensemble session to review the features and test together. We get a big group together, normally a, a group of stakeholders. So people like customer support or marketing or brand, whatever teams you want. Normally it's about six to eight people as my average because I find that's the most efficient. And we walk through the product and we trade off on who is controlling the experience. So who is moving the mouse and controlling what we look at? Who guides? So who says like, click here, do that? And that's generally done by the group. And then also we found we also need to trade off the role of who takes notes, who logs the issues that we find and makes follow-up stuff on them. So pairing 101 and ensemble testing have really helped break down the silos and build relationships. And we found that it moves the testing in our organization to a testing team responsibility to an org level responsibility. And it gets our team involved with other teams. So we see that other teams also begin to break down their silos as well because they're working with those teams like customer support or marketing as well, where they may not have done that outside of that ensemble session. So there are times when the features being developed, incisions are being made, that I wind up hearing about something that was decided at a later time. And so I found a large part of that. The reason that I was kind of left out of these conversations is because I wasn't in the room where it was happening. I wasn't in the place where decisions were being made. And especially for things like refinement meetings or, or design reviews or other meetings where the product is discussed. And I could give input that I think would be valuable. It would likely reduce the number of issues I'm finding early in the process. I would ask the, the stakeholder of that meeting to make me optional on those meetings. So that if we're talking about a product that's being developed that I know I want to get involved in, I can join that meeting, I'm optional. This has been really beneficial in teams I may not do testing for often, like backend teams, like our data team, but occasionally want to pop in just to make sure and remind, hey, if you want to talk about testing, let me know. I'm happy to discuss it. Let me see what's going on. And so as I began to join these meetings and as I continue to do so now, I've seen it has an impact. I found that I was more involved and it was more likely to be brought into similar meetings for myself and for my team. And the silos are starting to be broken down bit by bit. Within my organization and, and maybe within yours, when you're working on projects over a longer period of time, say a period over a few sprints, even if there are frequent small deliverables going out to customers, there tend to be cases where decisions are made between a small group of people through private channels like one-on-one -on -one slacks or individual conversations. And these decisions may also occur, occur within other silos. If say, it's another engineering or product team that you aren't included in. And so this can make it really hard to stay in the loop and to kind of know what's going on and what's happening. I mentioned those examples earlier where changes were made and I wasn't aware. Often it's because this happened in the silos. So what we do is for all medium-sized projects, so as well as projects that involve a really high risk, they're touching something that's really crucial, or where we find there are projects that have a large number of stakeholders, especially if it's cross-team. You have team A and team B and team C all together working on something. I like to make sure one of the first things we do is create a means for open communication. So in this case for us, it's a Slack channel, a temporary Slack channel for that project. And then we ask, we add everyone who's a stakeholder, and then we really push for all communication specific to this project, be it changes to the project, progress updates, questions and concerns, and it all happened in that channel. So even if someone has a conversation 
they put the notes of what they talked about in that channel so everyone is in the loop. And what I find is this really helps keep my team and other teams in the loop. It makes us feel more included compared with not being in the loop and hearing about things in the end. By providing training and education to other team members and how to use a product in your process for testing, the testing team can really help to ensure that everyone has a clear understanding of the testing process, as well as the importance of quality and testing related activities. So this can help build a culture of quality that we've talked about across the entire organization where every person takes ownership of quality. And they work together to ensure that the product meets the needs of the customers. In addition, training can really help kind of build trust and understanding relationships between teams. By involving other teams in testing related activities, such as exploratory testing sessions or code reviews, the testing team can help other team members to understand the value of these activities, as well as build a deeper appreciation for the work that the testing team does. So by providing training and education, the testing team can make sure everyone has the necessary skills and knowledge to effectively participate in testing related activities. And so this can help reduce the workload on the testing team as other team members are able to contribute to the testing effort and provide valuable feedback. So in my organization, my testing team in most cases is a team that knows the most about the product. We know it best because we're touching it every day in multiple parts of the product. We use it all the time. And so to help increase knowledge of the product itself and how to use it, we've actually been running a series of lunch and learns. So what we do is we have it where anyone from the organization can join and learn and review how a part of the product works. We do a little bit of hands-on stuff too. We ask them to create accounts or sign up for a subscription or something of that nature. Now, let's say you haven't done this. You're not really sure how to do it. Really great way to kick this off is, especially if you're not confident in like how well it'll be received, find any area that you feel you are knowledgeable in. That you find yourself often informing others on how that part of the product works. And then whatever communication space you have, in my case, Slack, set up a little poll. And so, if I'm not sure, I generally set it off, set it up as a, a text of something like, we want to help you focus on spreading product knowledge. And so if anyone's interested in learning more about X, this part of the product, leave an emoji, leave a thumbs up, leave a like, whatever. Now uh, you can also set up as a poll. So you can say, here are some areas we want to discuss. Can you all vote for the one you would like to learn about the most? And then from there, you can say, hey, we saw that in this poll, people really wanted to learn about X, who would be interested in attending a lunch and learn session. What's great about that is it gives you a direct audience to send the invite to. And you know that people who responded to that are likely genuinely interested and want to learn more. And they want to get more topics or interesting things to your core group. What, what's, what I've also seen as an added benefit is often those people then learn about it, are curious, and then help spread that knowledge to others in their team thus overall expanding general knowledge of the product. Standardizing tools is, is a really great effective way to break down silos within an org. So I found when different teams or departments are using different tools or technologies, it can be really difficult to collaborate effectively. And it can lead to things we talked about before, like duplication of effort or communication breakdowns. By standardizing when a set of tools or tech, you can create a shared language and a set of practices across the entire organization. So this can make it easier for teams to collaborate as it can help streamline processes and reduce inefficiencies. So, so for example, if let's say your organization has multiple teams working on different projects, standardizing on a common set of development tools, things like IDEs or code editors or version control systems or automated testing frameworks, it can help ensure that everyone is working with the same set of tools and has a shared understanding of how those tools should be used. Similarly, standardizing on a common set of communication tools, things like Slack or messaging apps, uh, Zoom, video conferencing software, software, or just generally project management tools, things like Jira or Notion. It can help 
to ensure that everyone's on the same page and has access to the same information. You don't have someone tagged on a tool they don't have access to and they have to join or aren't aware of, oh, what happened on this tool? Okay, well, I'm not on that tool. It helps to also reduce things like the learning curve for new employees or team members as instead of having to learn, you know, multiple tools, multiple automated testing frameworks, they only need to learn one. They need to learn a single set of tools and practices and they don't really have to adapt to different tools as much. And so at Storyblocks, we've been working on this ourselves, and digging into tools. We realized we had a lot of tools. We only had a few people using them. We had different teams using them. And so we kind of spun up this organic group, which consisted of members from various engineering squads, including my testing team. And we basically bonded over finding and, and kind of celebrating areas where we can consolidate tools. Maybe only one person is using it. Maybe there's another tool that does the same thing. What was a really cool added bonus is this really, really helped reduce cost. We could get rid of tools. And that's something great for things like your finance team or your engineering leader management. Building relationships. So having relationships with others, both within and outside your team, is one of the core ways we can break down the silos that may have impacted us. It helps promote crap collaboration. It helps promote trust and open communication, which helps to allow individuals and teams to work together towards a common goal and ultimately produce better outcomes. It can be difficult remotely, I know this, but I'd like to dive into some ideas for what can help. So when different teams or departments work in silos, it'd be really easy for individuals to feel disconnected from the larger organization and to lose sight of the common goal. What are we doing together? What is our org? What do we try to do? But by celebrating together, you can really help foster a sense of community and, and help nail the shared purpose that you all have. So the most common way we do this in my org is we do things like milestone celebration or achievements, especially things that happen across teams. So this includes product launches or completing a major milestone. We did a big thing on the site that we wanted to do. And what I found is this can really help to enforce the sense of shared purpose and achievement and it also helps with things like morale and, and building motivation. So you could also try, also try organizing volunteer events or community service activities that bring together individuals and especially from different teams or different departments. So what's cool about this is it can help build a sense of purpose beyond your organization and kind of set up a thing of like, hey, this is in addition to what we do here in our org, we also help out in the world around us. It can help reinforce the importance of social responsibility and collaboration. At Storyblocks, we, we did this in our engineering teams. We continue to do it pretty regularly, where we go out to local elementary schools and we volunteer to teach kids to code. It's a really great experience. You see a lot of really like young minds kind of getting engaged, which is an awesome feeling. But if you're not sure like where to start, just reach out to some local organizations. Put a thing on a local page where people post about, you know, when to get involved and just see where people need help. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Recognition. So recognizing the efforts of the teams around you can help to establish a positive impact of others that others have on you and in the production of your product. So recognition helps to break down silos and kind of promote the collaboration we've talked about. By recognizing the contributors and individuals and teams in the organization, you help to build a sense of community and, and shared purpose which ultimately leads to better outcomes and kind of a more positive work environment. So I personally like to lean towards one-on-one -on -one peer recognition, as I found it gives kind of like the most positive bang for your buck, most impact across teams. And so for us, we do this by calling out those teams or people that helped when we announce product releases. So we do these in a channel. So the product manager will say, hey, thanks customer support. Thanks testing team for the efforts you all did. As well as we also have this program where we can give others points and high fives for doing something for us. So you help me out. Thanks. Here's 100 points. And then those points can be redeemed for items or gift cards or whatever. And we really make an effort to push this. The points expire on a quarterly basis. And it feels like it really helps lift the mood. When you get a bunch of points and you can redeem them and treat yourself, it's a nice feeling. And so while it's nice having access to fancier tooling for this, if you don't have that, 
frankly, you can just start by saying thanks. This simple, hey, you really helped make a positive impact on my day. I really appreciate it. And that goes a really, really long way. At least that found. Interpersonal connection and relationships can really help break down the silos as they create a direct one-on-one -on -one bond through the org. And so they make approaching others and leaning on others when you need them a little bit easier as you've already established something with that person. We talked about examples like this earlier with the onboarding thing. Especially if these relationships go into non-work related discussions, they can form bonds that last a very long time, a lifetime even. And so this time together can come in many forms. It can be group efforts, things like happy hours or, or lunchtime hangouts, to just individual time together, taking some time in the morning to ask someone about their weekend, walking over to them saying, hey, how's your weekend? What's going on? And so it's much easier to do in person, but it's not impossible to do remote. If the organic nature of this doesn't really exist in your org, start by introducing things like icebreakers in your meetings. When you have a meeting, leave a few meeting, a few minutes in the beginning and start the meeting by talking about a silly story. Hey, some silly thing happened to me over the weekend. Or start with a silly question, something like, hey, what's your favorite breakfast food? It really helps relax participants and builds bonds. And I've also found within those meetings, it helps make people more likely to volunteer, volunteer ideas and have discussions. So in my organization, we have an office space. I'm in it now. It's optional, but we're primarily a remote company, and at this point in time, particularly. Recently, we've been trying out things like remote virtual offices, and we found that it actually really helps with that organic, hey, I just want to say hi to you. So I want to highlight one app in particular we've been using. It's this app called GatherTown. And what's cool is it allows a small amount of users for free to create a virtual office space and then more to pay them out. And we're currently trying it out, but... What I personally found is it really helps when you want to hang out. Let's say you have that time between meetings where you know you're not going to do anything. You can actually make it productive. You can go chat with someone. Or you just want to like say hi or grab lunch together or something. Or have a happy hour. It makes it a nice space for that can occur. So when different teams or departments are working in isolation from one another, it can be really easy for individuals to develop this us and them. A mentality in which we view others as obstacles or hindrances to their to our success. But by practicing empathy, individuals can learn to see things from others' perspectives and get a better understanding of their needs, motivations, and concerns. So for example, if let's say you're part of a testing team that is often brought in at the end of a project, you may feel frustrated by the fact that you don't have enough time to thoroughly test the product. However, if you're practicing empathy, you can try to see things from the perspective of the development team or the person who's requesting you test, who may be under pressure to deliver the product on time. And they may not have had time or thought to, or had the resources to involve the testing team earlier. By understanding their perspective, you can really work together to find solutions that benefit both teams and the overall project. Empathy is really key in that I think it can help reduce conflicts and misunderstandings. By taking the time to understand others' perspectives and needs, and individuals can really communicate and more effectively find common ground. It can help to build trust and mutual respect, which ultimately leads to just a better outcome and, and a better place to be at. Now, in those situations, like I mentioned earlier, it can be really easy to create silos of us versus them. In particular, if you think when someone does something, they did it for a reason that wasn't the best interest of you or the organization. But I find assuming a positive intention of the person often helps put me in a better mindset, put me in their shoes and give me more empathy than not. And it makes me think that, oh, I think what they did, they did for a reason that was in the best interest of them and the best, or the best interest of us in the organization versus best interest of them and was selfish. Additionally, and find not playing the blame game helps. It helps create these bonds and breaks down the silos. So once again, this is something that, that's easy to do, but when things happen, it's harder than you think. So what I like to do is I like to acknowledge that when things happen, it's blameless. Try to make it as blameless as possible and avoid the, they did this to because of that, and, and I did that, and the back and forth that can happen. 
Blame can really stick with people, and it can become something that teams bond over. It creates silos, but not in the kind that you want. So if you use Scrum on a regular basis, you may already be familiar with this uh, practice, and that is the prime directive. Regardless of what we discover, we must understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job he or she could, given what was known at the time, his or her skills and the abilities, the resources available and the situation at hand. So you should try to acknowledge the best you can and move on. Feedback. So asking for feedback demonstrates a willingness to learn and improve, which can really help to build trust and respect between teams by actively seeking out feedback and taking action on it. Teams can show that they're committed to working together towards a common goal and improve the, all, the overall success of the organization. So in Storyblocks, we like to try just periodically checking in to see how my team is doing. So let's say, for example, we run a group ensemble testing session. We'll ask participants to take a quick survey just to get feedback on how the process worked for them. Is there anything we could change? Is there something we could do better? And so recently, we were working on this this thing where we were getting together as a group to evaluate our end-to-end -end tasks, determine if they were still needed. We started doing this in person, and we found that it was really slow and not working. And so we asked for feedback, and the feedback we got is like, we want something more efficient. And so we wound up doing this as an async survey. We found there was a greater desire to participate, and we also found there was a greater shared product knowledge because people would get in there and actually look at the stuff we were talking about, which helped to break down the silos. We also do this across teams now, where we have like anonymous surveys that measure how our culture is doing. And what we found is like when you have problems that people have collectively that, that we make it public, we can bond over how to fix and address them. So in summary, to help break down the silos, they're often created. We can work to do things like onboarding, process improvements, and build relationships. It's something we need to work on regularly. Keep in mind every day, as otherwise these silos are going to form back up quickly. So we've discussed why we should and how to break down silos, but I just want to take a few minutes to go over kind of some of the benefits I've seen once we break the silos down. So first and foremost, breaking down silos helps to establish and improve relationships. Teams and members within teams begin to collaborate and communicate more effectively, which can help build relationships based on mutual respect and understanding. Members of the team begin to get to know each other a bit better, which can help make it easier to pair or have tough conversations without any bad feelings when those conversations occur. When teams build relationships, I see people more likely to ask for feedback and take action on it, which demonstrates a willingness to learn and improve. And this can help build trust and respect between teams by showing they're committed to working together towards a common goal. As we begin to increase the communication and collaboration, as we begin to break down the silos, we see a greater amount of knowledge sharing and thus less situations in which we're doing duplicate work that counteracts the work another team is doing. We see our goals are more aligned. We may have alignment not just across the testing team, but a greater body of teams like all of engineering. We see the collaboration increases, the efficient, efficiency increases as we found the teams are talking to each other and coordinating more on projects, getting our features out faster. It's also found there's a greater understanding of how the product works. And then finally, this is something I know many of us in testing teams will care about. When silos are broken down and you do things like moving the testing phases earlier in the feature development process, or others begin to think more about how something can be testable when in the initial phases, it helps to reduce the number of bugs that go out to customers. And I've seen this in my own is when I, I see a, a decrease in the number of bugs found later in the phases and after something has been rolled out, because we're involved and we're finding the bugs earlier. That's all I got. Thank you for taking the time to check out my talk today and learn about silos and what we can do to break out of them. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn if you have any questions, feedback, or generally if I can just assist you in how to break out of the silos. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks for joining us for this virtual bonus session. We hope you enjoyed it. Learn more about InflectorCon, our live in-person conference from April 19th through the 21st, 2023 in Washington, DC by visiting inflectorcon.com. Stay tuned for more great content, news and events from Inflectra. Learn more at inflectra.com forward slash company.